This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Tahone, and today is Monday, and that means it's time for the 488th MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. At least, that's normally what I do in this series. Sometimes, I like to look at cards on the other end of the spectrum, the absolute worst Magic cards of all time, and that's what we're doing today with a look at the worst Planeswalker cards ever. This is a topic I originally covered way back in 2016 in the 32nd MTG Top 10, but that list is deeply flawed, mostly because at the time I was only using data from Magic's competitive formats to make the list, and not really considering EDH at all. That Top 10 is one of my most viewed videos ever, and it's also the video I've made with the largest percentage of dislikes ever, and that makes a lot of sense. There are several cards on that list that have no business being there at all as a result of my flawed methodology back then. So I've been interested in revisiting this topic for a while so that I can more accurately discuss the worst Planeswalkers of all time. There have obviously also been a whole lot of Planeswalkers printed since 2016, so this list is very different from that one. Generally speaking, of course, Planeswalkers are quite powerful arguably the most powerful card type in this entire game. This is because Planeswalkers can come down and use one of their loyalty abilities right away, and then on subsequent turns they can use one of those loyalty abilities for more and more value, and you don't even have to pay additional mana on those later turns. This can allow them to really snowball and take over games, especially because many of them have game-ending ultimate abilities. However, there are definitely some awful Planeswalkers out there. The type alone is not quite enough to make a card really good because if you make a planeswalker that's overcosted or give it underpowered abilities, it doesn't really matter that it can use those abilities every turn. While this type of list is not data driven the same way my lists about the best cards are, there are a couple of requirements that cards on the list have to meet to be considered for it. In particular, they can't be widely played in EDH and they can't ever have top aided a significant magic event. I use EDH rec for the EDH side of things since it has a database of almost 700,000 decks. In the end though, the cards on this list and where they appear on it are based on my opinion. One thing to keep in mind with this list is that these cards are bad relative to other Planeswalkers. Because Planeswalkers are inherently cards that add to the board and use an ability every turn, it's hard for cards on this list to be quite as awful as some of the cards we've seen on other worst lists. For that reason, the cards on this list see significantly more play in EDH than most cards on worst lists do. But yeah, the cards in this list certainly are awful when compared to other Planeswalkers. Before we jump into the list, let me tell you about this video's special sponsor, Into the AM. I've been working with them for a while now, and they've been a really great sponsor. They're an apparel company that produces a whole bunch of great stuff, including graphic tees, like the one I'm wearing now. This one is called Adventure Pack, and it features a pretty cool image of a backpack or satchel that contains a wilderness landscape within it. If you like this tea or want to check out even more of them, go check out their store. Use my special link from the description to get 10% off. All right, let's dive into the list. At number 10, I have Jace, the Living Guild Pact. There are only two holdovers from the 2016 list, and this is one of them. This Jace just does very, very little. The big problem is that neither of his main abilities actually give you a card in any way. His plus one improves your card quality and maybe puts something in your graveyard that you want there, and his minus three simply bounces a non-land permanent. That does mean he can do something to the board right away, but he has to lower his loyalty to two to do it. And because the card only gets bounced, you're just getting a tiny bit of tempo, and even then, you may not be getting much. Basically, he doesn't do a good job of protecting himself or building you a significant advantage. And even if you do get to his ultimate, it isn't the kind that can win you the game from behind or anything like that. Sure, you're going to win in a few turns because you have way more cards than your opponent, but if the board state isn't already favorable, you might just be dead before it matters. 
At number 9, I have Tybalt, the Fiend Blooded. Another holdover from the 2016 list. I actually had him at number 1 last time, so things have actually gotten better for him over the last several years. He's still pretty awful, though. It's neat that he's a two-mana planeswalker, and for a long time he was the only one, but like Jace the Living Guild Pact, he just doesn't have abilities that allow you to build any real advantage. He starts with super low loyalty of two, which says to me they were a little worried about printing a two-mana planeswalker. And the same could be said about his awful abilities. It's nice that his plus one loots, but the fact that the discard is random really limits how effective Tybalt can be, since the best thing you can get out of looting is taking advantage of the card you discard, and he lowers your chances of that ever happening because you don't get to choose to discard your card with madness or flashback or whatever. He also has a minus four that isn't even close to worth the loyalty since most opponents aren't going to have enough cards in hand to make it worth it. His ultimate can definitely win the game on the spot, but good luck ever getting his loyalty to 6 when he starts at 2 and has absolutely no good way to protect himself. At number 8 I have Soren, Vampire Lord. One of the big changes to the pool of Planeswalker cards since I made that 2016 list is Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers. Planeswalker decks were a product that existed between 2017 and 2020, and they were intended as introductory products for new players. They were pre-constructed decks that featured a central Planeswalker card. These Planeswalkers are intentionally powered down so that they play well against other Planeswalker decks, but they aren't so good otherwise. They tend to be overcosted for what they do and often have underwhelming abilities. As you might imagine, the remaining cards on this list are all from those decks. This makes it a truly remarkable achievement that both Tybalt the Fiendblooded and Jace the Living Guild Pact made this list, since there are more than enough Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers to fill up this list, but I actually think those two cards are worse than all but the eight Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers who did make this list. Anyway, the first of these we're looking at is Soren Vampire Lord. He costs a whopping 6 mana and only has 4 starting loyalty. His ability that allows him to raise his loyalty by 1 is really, really unimpressive, as he simply gives plus 2, plus 0 to a single creature. That's right, no keyword ability or anything. His minus 2 is certainly more impressive, as it allows him to do 4 to something and you gain 4 life, but the fact that he goes down to 2 loyalty to do that right away is pretty rough. Even if he does manage to kill one creature, he's probably going to go down after that, and you expect a lot more than that out of your 6 mana investment. He does have a kind of cool Vampire Tribal Ultimate that lets you make all your vampires mind control opposing creatures, but that's still an ultimate that is asking you to have some sort of board state to do something in the first place, and a pretty specific board state at that, and that's just not going to always work out. Despite the popularity of the vampire creature type, Soren is barely played in EDH, and the reasons why are obvious. At number 7 I have Nyssa, Genesis Mage. She costs 7 mana and she doesn't do anything to permanently add to the board. She certainly doesn't get anywhere close to delivering on what you'd expect from a 7 mana card. Her plus 2 lets you untap 2 lands and 2 creatures. This at least can allow you to protect her, provided you have the bodies to do so, and it also lets her ramp a bit, at least on future turns. The ability that really sinks this Planeswalker though is her minus 3, which just gives a single creature plus 5, plus 5 until end of turn. I mean, yeah, that's a big boost, but it doesn't do anything to protect her or change the board in any real way, and that's a lot of loyalty to lose. That ability might give you one really good attack, but that's pretty much it. She does have a reasonably impressive ultimate, especially when compared to some of the ultimates that we're going to see on this list, but I just can't get over this Nissa costing so much mana and still being a very easily beatable Planeswalker. At number 6, I have Jace, Arcane Strategist. For 6 mana, you get a 4 loyalty Planeswalker who only has 2 abilities. He does come with a static ability, and it's one that synergizes with his plus 1, but it's still not enough. Yes, he does make sure you draw a second card on the turns when he is in play, but the payoff for that is simply that you put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on a single creature. He tops this all off with a minus 7 that can't win you the game often enough. Sure, making your whole board unblockable is sweet, and theoretically, he has buffed your board some, but you have to have lethal damage ready to go, and you just won't always be able to set that up unless your opponent hasn't been doing anything at all to hinder your progress, and that's way too much to ask for. At number 5, I have Garruk, Savage Herald, another 6 mana planeswalker who really fails to deliver. He has a plus 1 that is conditional card draw, and a minus 2 that is only useful if you have a creature big enough to take down an opposing creature. 
That makes it pretty darn narrow, and means you won't always be able to deal with your opponent's most problematic threat, which also means that Garrick is probably going down. Then, like most of those on this list, he has an ultimate that asks you to already be decently far ahead on the board for it to do anything. This isn't a Planeswalker that's going to help you win a game you might have lost. It's a Planeswalker who can help you build an already sizable advantage, and that's just not what you expect from most walkers. At number 4, I have Rowan, Fearless Spark Mage. She has the lowest mana value of any card on this list, but she's still pretty bad. Partly because she costs 5 mana and has abilities that indicate she wants to be played in an aggro deck. Her plus 1 can certainly make a creature into a way better attacker, and her minus 2 can pick off a couple of small creatures while also making them unable to block, but at her cost, she isn't going to do enough to propel an aggro deck to a win. Meanwhile, if you're not in an aggro deck, she's just terrible, even with an ultimate that gives you control of all creatures. At number 3, I have Liliana Death Wielder. She is the most widely played in EDH of all the Planeswalkers that made this list, but I think that's mostly because people are desperate for minus one, minus one counter stuff, so some people are stooping to playing the Death Wielder in commander decks that care about that kind of thing, and that's pretty sad because she's awful. Like Nyssa Genesis made, she costs 7, but feels more like a Planeswalker you'd pay about 4 mana for. The turn you play her, her impact on the board will typically be quite small, as she'll just put a minus 1 minus 1 counter on one creature. The very next turn she can straight up remove a creature, but the turn of setup is pretty rough. Obviously, she does get better in a deck that puts minus one minus one counters on stuff, but a seven mana planeswalker should not be asking you for this amount of setup to simply remove a creature. And her ultimate isn't even that impressive. If I have to get to 10 loyalty to use an ultimate, it better do something awesome. And while reanimating your whole graveyard is pretty cool, it really feels like it should probably also reanimate your opponent's graveyard too. At number 2, I have Teferi Timeless Voyager. For 6 mana, you get a 4 loyalty planeswalker with 3 really underwhelming abilities. I mean, raising loyalty to draw a card isn't a bad deal, but it also doesn't do anything to help Teferi stick around. His minus 3 is a little bit better than that, since he time ebbs something, and that is a real 1 for 1, albeit the worst form of 1 for 1 removal there is, since your opponent will get back whatever it is you put on top of their library. And if you're behind on board and you have to use that right away, that also means you're lowering his loyalty to 1, which means he will be very easy to finish off. He also has a really weak ultimate. Sure, it's cool that he gets to phase out all of your opponent's creatures, but for the amount of loyalty you're paying, you'd think it would do something a little more permanent. It does effectively make your creatures unblockable the turn you use it, but if your opponent just untaps and plays a creature or two, your advantage is significantly diminished, and their creatures will be coming back on their next turn. It's also yet another ability that really requires you to have a good board state to actually win the game with it, and that's always kind of a bummer. And at number one, it's Mu Yanling, Celestial Wind. She's the least played Planeswalker on all of EDA Trek, and you can see why. Like a lot of the walkers on this list, she costs six and just doesn't do anything meaningful. Her plus one can help her stick around, since it gives minus five, minus zero to a single creature. But obviously it becomes a lot less impressive if your opponent just has like three creatures around, and even if she does stick around, she isn't very impressive. Bouncing two things with that minus three will feel good for a second, but the loyalty cost doesn't match the power of the ability and the mana you paid. Your opponent will take a bit of a tempo hit, but then just be right back where they were. Look, if you're ahead, you can see a scenario where you use her plus one twice and then use her ultimate, but even that isn't that impressive. You need to have a decent number of flyers and your opponent has to be completely unable to block or interact with them for the ultimate to feel worth it, and that just won't happen often enough. So, those are my picks for the 10 worst Planeswalker cards we've ever seen. Do you think there are any Planeswalkers that are even worse than these? Let me know in the comments. If you want to own any of these terrible cards, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each of them. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you stay aware of future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, including several more that look at awful cards, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. And lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and my work on the channel, there are several ways you can, and you can find them all in the description. Thanks for watching.